Welcome to the Business Leadership Series, where we engage with leaders who are making an impact on their worlds and who want to share their knowledge and experience for your personal and professional growth. The following interview is designed to inspire you to become the best leader you can be. Your host, Derek Champagne, is the founder and CEO of The Artist Evolution, a full-service agency building successful brands, marketing tools, and campaigns, and also the author of the best-selling book, Don't Buy a Duck. And now, let's begin today's Leadership Series interview. Welcome to the Business Leadership Series, where our goal is to inspire you to become the best leader that you can be. I'm excited about our show today. We are doing Series 2 of our Shark Tank Veterans Interviews. Over the past year, we've gone to interview dozens of guests from the hit ABC TV show Shark Tank. Uh, The first guest we're going to talk to is someone I've had the opportunity to work with over the past year on some other projects. You've seen him on some ABC made-for-TV movies. He's on Fox News, CNN, uh, writes for the New York Times, the Boston Globe, Huffington Post, and has dozens of best-selling books. He's the founder and CEO of Business Ghost, and he was on season one of Shark Tank. He didn't get a deal, but this guy is amazing, and he won the judges over even though they didn't do a deal with him. Let's listen to a segment of my interview with the great Michael Levin. Uh, t- tell me tell me about being on Shark Tank. I went back and watched that because I've, I've seen every episode of Shark Tank every season because I just I love the show. So I went back and watched it after I had met you. And I just, I just thought you were, you handled yourself very coolly, and it was cool to see Damon and, and Mark and those guys just, just with the big smiles and, and enjoying being in your presence and talking with you. So, what was that like being on that show? Oh, it, it wasn't like anything I've ever done. I felt as though I'd been miniaturized and shrunk and stuck in my TV set, and uh, <laughs> you know, just walking, you know, walking down. It's not real sharks; it's video of sharks in the shark tank when you're walking down the little okay. corridor. And then, you know, then you stand there and the cameras have to uh, focus on you and get everything right. So you stand there for two minutes before you even say a word. And, you you know, they're looking at you. You're looking at them. You can't say anything. And it's really unnerving. And then then you're hoping you're going to be able to remember your pitch and deliver it one time because you don't have any notes. And that's the first time they see you. That's the first time you see them. Hmm. So you're so, you know, you're so relieved you got your pitch out that then you forget that they're going to start asking you questions. <laughs> yeah, uh, and tough questions too, right? Yeah, and t- I, I have to say that they were very kind to me and very respectful. And I later on watched, uh, you know, a, a highlight reel of the way they just destroy people. And I realized that I was very fortunate. But the show was, it was sort of like an intervention on me as an entrepreneur I, I, I just always saw myself until then as a writer guy who was kind of running a business. But the respect that they gave me, one of them said, you know, you've done what 0.0001% of writers has ever done. You figured out how to make a good living at it. Right. Um, and run business. You know, when they said that, I, I, something inside me changed. It was really as if the whole show, the purpose of the show was not to get me a deal, but to do an, a, you know, an, a nationally televised intervention on me so that I would recognize <laughs> You know, that I am a business owner and that I'm not the knucklehead that I kind of think I am when it comes to uh, that part of what I do. So I did, I, I did not get a deal, but the, uh, the, I don't really need one. It's not that kind of business right. And uh, from my perspective. And, you know, what I do really isn't scale. I mean, Damon said, can you do a lower price version for, for people with less means? And I said, I honestly can't right. because, you know, how do I maintain the quality? And I've never even seen the whole episode. I watched the first couple of minutes and I couldn't stand it. It was just, you know, I knew I was going to lose. But so every, I, I told my wife last night, because after the episode re-airs every eight weeks on, I guess, on MSNBC yes, or CNBC. It and uh-huh. <laughs> and it, it aired this week. And the phone rings and people call it. I said, you know, I have a very weird business model. Uh, I told her, you know, every eight weeks I lose on national television and the phone rings. So, you know, go Go figure. Well, that was my next question. What kind of response did you get when that aired? It was phenomenal. Um, I got a lot of, I, I mean, I, I get prospects every time it airs, which is great. And on top of that, uh, people called in. They had different ideas for my business model. And I talked to every single one of them because I figured, you know, maybe they know something I don't know. Hmm. And uh, there were some nutty people and there were some outlandish proposals. Um, but it was uh, you know, it's a unique experience. I mean, it's a unique experience to, you know, stand there in front of these people. Um, my clients are all successful people, and I've, I've worked with a bunch of billionaires before, so I wasn't, you know, cowed by them. They're really no different. I did my homework. I read their books. I read up on them so sure. I could, you know, schmooze them effectively. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> You did schmooze and, you know, them very well. 
<laughs> Thank you. Yes, it was. You know, we we had a and I had a game plan with Kevin because I knew he was going to come in hard and heavy. So I knew that whatever he said to, if he went into attack mode, I just was going to look at him and say, Kevin, 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 <laughs> is this how is this how it's going to be between us? <laughs> and, and at that moment, not only did the, he and the rest of the sharks laugh, but the whole you could hear the stagehands, you could hear the crew laughing on the set. <laughs> And, and, you know, at that moment, everything changed. It's, well, when, it's, you know, when Mr. Wonderful relaxes and smiles a certain way and you want him over, that's a big deal because it sets the tone for the room, too. Well, that's exactly it. And, I mean, it's, you know, it was, uh, it, 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 it was just another sales call. Uh, I mean, it wasn't, but it was. It's, it's something where, you, you know, you have, to know, you have to know what you want. You have to know the, uh, the people across the table. You have to establish rapport and, uh, and find a way to connect with them. And, you know, if people have written books and you don't read their books, then you're an idiot. So, you know, right. if you don't, if, 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 you, if you go in cold into a room and you could have prepared and you could have known something about them and you could have established a basis of, of uh, meaningful rapport based on something that is out there already. I mean, I'm, I'm working on a proposal right now for an individual and uh, uh, she referenced on her website that she had been blindsided in a divorce. Well, I picked up and I, and I mentioned that in the email and I said that must have been very painful. And I, and I, I, I applaud you for, uh, you know, for, for taking that hit and then keeping going and, and building a new life for yourself. Now, you know, does she want to be reminded that she was blindsided by her divorce? Probably not. But the thing is that it's up there on her website. So it, what it does is that it indicates that I took the time to act her and to get to know her instead of just throwing numbers at her. So. That's powerful. It's the way of doing business. That's a great lesson not to get lazy in our in our sales meetings. Sometimes we get good enough at our craft, and this has happened to me, where you know we think we've got it because in our own merit because we're so comfortable with what we do. But you're so right. We we need to understand who we're going to talk to, and what's relevant to them, and and what their contributions are, and and what's important to them. And that's that's a great reminder not to get lazy with who we're going to meet if we still love what we do and, we, and we're motivated. Yeah, I mean, that's that's exactly it. And and two things come to mind when you say that. One is that uh, I once heard it said that life is a battle between comfort and excellence. And uh, there's no there's no there's no excellence. There's no growth in the comfort zone. So my job is to keep expanding my comfort zone, keep stepping outside it, and keep you know. And 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 I, and I do that. And I, I I've taught writing for 25, 26 years. And I was telling the classes, I get more rejections, uh, rejection letters in any given year than all of you have gotten in your entire writing careers combined. Wow. But the thing, but the thing is that life isn't about ad, a batting average. It's about it's about did you did you try and did you succeed? And you know, and not to get political, but they're making a lot of fun of Donald Trump and his stakes and you know some of the other ventures. You know, the person who doesn't uh, try things, uh, you know, you miss 100 percent of the shots you don't take. That's what Gretzky said. So, wow. you know, let's let's get, and, and the other thing. I mean, there's a there's a Harvey McKay story in uh, one of his books about his paper company, and what he says is that he would send his cars, uh, he would send a guy in a car out and follow the delivery truck of the competition, and that, you know, and just watch where they dropped off envelopes. And so now he would turn that information over to his sales team and say, "This is where X Y Z envelope company is selling. Go to those places and undercut them." Huh. And, and, and he would win over tons of, so the thing is that you don't know who's doing competitive intelligence on you. You don't know who's, you don't, maybe you know who your competition is. Maybe you don't, but you know, I, I, I as, as we mentioned, but just before we started the, the interview, we both have kids right. and a family and responsibilities. If I get fat and happy, you know, it's not just me that's going down. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, my kids are counting on, on, on me. My wife is counting on me and my your employees. Uh, yeah. I've got 30 writers. I've got a team of 30 something people. Right. If, if, if I get, if I get lazy and fat and happy, uh, you know, people say, do you ever get writer's block? And I say, no, I have writer's mortgage. So, you know, it's just, a, <laughs> it's just a question of, uh, you know, yes, that's... Let's, let, let's not get carried away. Our thanks again to Michael Levin for being our guest. Uh, really enjoy following that guy. And he's got a, uh, at a businessghost.com. You can sign up and uh, follow his weekly muses that he shares through email. And they're, they're never dull and they're always interesting to read. Hey, next we're going to talk with Stephen Sashin of Zero Shoes. He was on Shark Tank as well. Turned down a deal from Mr. Wonderful. This guy is a sharp individual, has a great business. He is uh, was one of the top SEO guys in the world at one point in the early days of SEO and uh, has owned many several uh, successful businesses uh, before he was ever on Shark Tank. Let's join in with him now and hear his interview about turning down a deal with Mr. Wonderful and then him sharing his perspective on being in the tank. 
it's making more sense to me now that I see your background and understand more about just the, the, the level of professional that you already at and then the other businesses you had, but what was that like for you, that experience? Um, and then walking out of the, the tank, what was that like for you? Well, the show itself is really surreal. It looks like a conversation, but in real time when you're there, it's just a free-for-all. So one of the sharks will ask you five questions, and while you're answering number three, two of the other sharks ask you five more questions each. And if you switch to their questions, the first one gets mad. And if you don't switch, the other two get mad. And huh. it's um, and sometimes they're paying attention to you, and most of the time they're not. And they're juggling like repartee with each other and trying to battle it out and find the funniest one-liner that's going to get them on the highlight reel and make them more <laughs> famous and build their brand. And it was just, uh, it, it was really nuts. Um, Lena, very, my wife, very quickly realized that this is not a um, business show on television. It's a television show that is loosely about business. Mm. And so there's certain things you can't do. You can't be glib. You can't, you know, you we had watched the Sharks for months and months and months. We read their autobiographies. We saw every episode of the show. Mm. Um, but they don't know who we are. So, you know, that false sense of, familiarity is false right. and you can't pretend that you know these people or more accurately you have to be very attentive to not acting like you know these people because they don't know you and the more friendly you act or the more friendly they entice you to be the more likely you're going to say something stupid that you might mm. say to a friend but would never say to an investor right um so that was an interesting thing to realize. Like there was a joke that I, I, I like to tell. It's a true thing, but it's a, got a punchline. And the producers wanted me to tell it, so I did. And that is uh, after I got back into sprinting and got rid of my injuries by, by going uh, barefoot and then in sandals that I started making that ev eventually evolved into zero shoes, um, I became a master's all-American sprinter, which means I'm one of the fastest guys over the age of 50. And what that really means is for men over 50, you may be talking to the fastest Jew in the world. <laughs> and it got did not get that laugh. No. Uh, paying attention. And Cuban then kind of hears it out of the back of his brain. He goes, wait, what did you just say? And I, I said it again and he chuckled, but I instantly realized, you know, no jokes because if they're not all paying attention, it could, they could edit it. So I say this funny thing and then they just cut to the sharks looking at me like, what the hell is right. that? So there's all this kind of craziness that happens when you, when you're involved, um, when you're in the tank, that's just different than the way it looks on the show. And a lot of these and, are things you're realizing while you're standing in front of oh, them. Totally in real Man, time. Wow. Totally okay. Real time. Now, you know, the good news for me is again, I, I was a stand up comic for a dozen years. And so um, that's what I do is just mm -hmm. just kind of you know riff on what's happening. So I, I was the moment we walked out was I was thrilled because that's my element. Like let's talk to people and see what happens. Right. Um, and and that part was fun. The offer Kevin offered us four hundred grand for half the company, which was just not going to happen. We we forgot that he even made the offer, frankly. Uh, and and I know that some people freaked out by the uh, the fact that we turned down almost half a million dollars. Right. But it was just a bad deal. We knew that we had talked to venture capitalists, bankers, people who had sold footwear companies, people who bought footwear companies, people who invested in footwear companies. Uh, and we, we knew what the, um, uh, the value, the range of valuations, uh, were for those different kinds of buyers and sellers. And we walked in with a, a number that we were comfortable with and we were negotiable, but we were just, you know, not on the same page. Sure. So, so walking out, frankly, it was just totally nerve wracking because, um, you know, that, uh, how do I want to put this? You know that they edit the show and we thought we weren't going to give them a whole lot of ammunition, but you know, there's no way you can spend 20 to 40 to two hours, 40 minutes to two hours. We were in there for about 45 minutes without giving them something that they could edit into making us look insane. Sure. So, uh, so there was a couple of crazy moments where Barbara said, I hated you from the moment you walked out here. You look like my ex-husband. It's like, what am I going to oh. do with that? So, <laughs> I remember that. I forgot about that. <laughs> yeah, it's like I, I tweeted to her on the night of the show. I said, you should have invested. I would have used some of that money for plastic surgery. <laughs> So, um, you know, the, the few, like Cuban and I got into an argument about email open rates, which was really obscure, but they could have made that look really weird. And, you know, every objection that the sharks had, we hit out of the park so far that at one point, Robert jumped out of his chair. You don't see this on the show. He jumps out of his chair and yells, you have a perfect answer for every question. And, and I just looked at him kind of incredulously. I said, this is our business. Right. So, um, but all that said, 
uh, you know, they tape more segments than they air. So, and they don't tell you when, if you're going to air. So we walked out of there not knowing what was going to happen next huh. and just having to wait. And then two weeks before we aired, they, we actually took our first vacation in three and a half years and the last one we've taken. And we're in Ecuador <laughs> visiting friends and we get an email saying you're going to be on in a couple of weeks. Like, ah, crap, there goes wow. the vacation. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> How long uh, so, was it from the air from the time you shot the the show till it actually aired? Um, six months. Okay. And 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 it was great for us in every possible way. We did about three months worth of sales in the week following the show. Mm. The notoriety we've gotten from being on the show has been invaluable. Right. Uh, uh, frankly, trying to get a follow up because that show really has, in many ways, you know, I I, I like to say Shark Tank made us rich. Not personally, we, we still have barely taken. Um, we're taking nominal salaries because we're putting everything we can back into the company because right. we need more inventory. So, uh, but, but when we go into retail, uh, buyers, they've all seen us on the show. And so that's mm. just been invaluable. Yeah. That's, yeah. that's powerful. Yeah. So, and you've been recognized. I read somewhere where you were, oh. you were tell me about that. What's that like to be recognized? Uh, yeah, shoes I, I first and then yeah. Um, you know, it's a funny thing. I get recognized in two different ways now. One is people go, hey, you're that guy. And uh, and that happens all the time. And it's um, it's fun, actually. I mean, it's not at a level – if it, if it was increased by like tenfold, I can imagine wanting to uh, put on makeup and hide myself and not be seen. Right. But it's just enough that, you know, it's entertaining. And besides, it helps business. So I'm all for that. Right. The the what's happened now though that's even more fun is people will recognize my f- shoes and not recognize me, <laughs> and that's that one I like even that's more. That's really cool. Yeah, that's a good sign. Yeah. Um, one of the things about zero shoes, I, I warn people. I go just so you know, if you don't like talking to strangers, don't wear these shoes because they will cu- stop you and ask you about your shoes. Huh. And in fact, um, it's funny. There was a guy, uh, our sales, our VP of sales was walking through a mall just a couple hours ago to get lunch. And someone literally stopped him in the mall and said, you know, you're, you know, that website is down right now, right? (laughs) (laughs) It's just like, holy moly. That's great. Thanks again to Steven Sashin of Zero Shoes. Uh, You can listen to his entire interview and Michael's if you go back in the Business Leadership Series archives. um, And we've got some extended interviews with them that goes way beyond what they just did in the tank uh, and talks about some other advice about building and sustaining your business. Our next guest is Fleetwood Hicks from Villy Customs. This guy got a deal in the Shark Tank. His business partners are Barbara Cochran and Mark Cuban. You imagine that? Uh, what great partners they've been for him, too. He's been a very successful entrepreneur over the years, uh, but his latest business, Villy Customs, with his partners, Barbara and Mark, uh, was in the Shark Tank a few years ago, and he's had wild success since then. His product is used by celebrities, some of the biggest celebrities in the world, and what a just a great down-to-earth guy who's got some amazing wisdom. Let's listen to the interview now with Fleetwood Hicks about how Shark Tank changed his business. He has sold product in all 50 states. He's got a really cool product. Fleetwood, welcome to the program today. Uh, thank you, Derek. Thanks for having me. It's great to be on, and uh, I'm excited. Before we had the show a few years ago, I remember watching Shark Tank, and I promise you we won't <laughs> stay on Shark Tank the whole time, but that's how I first got introduced to your product. And at the time, sitting with my wife watching the show, I said, man, I'd really love to interview that guy. What a cool product. You were 100 Most Brilliant Business Ideas in Entrepreneur Magazine in 2010, featured in CNN Success, and then you've got all these celebrities riding around on your bikes, too. That must be pretty cool. Wow, man. Uh, you know a lot about me. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> um, no, it is. It is. It's really exciting to, to um, first of all, to have been on Shark Tank and have uh, Mark and Barbara on board, which they're fantastic. And um, yeah, we have had a lot of uh, a lot of good things happen with celebrities and stuff, and uh, we got we got more things like that in the works. So it's always exciting. So into what you're doing today, how did it all start? Well, uh, you know, they they always say that you got to do what you love, and uh, it took me a long time to figure that out. But um, uh, straight out of college, I basically was in real estate. Kind of realized that wasn't my thing. I I did well. I just didn't enjoy it. So for the next 20 years, I really just um, I worked on my own businesses. I had apparel companies and bottled water companies and custom uh, corporate clothing companies and stuff like that. And um, what finally happened, um, you know, I had a lot of success in some of my business and I had some very big failures as well. Um, mm-hmm. Shut a lot of companies down and stuff along the way. But what finally happened was I was launching a new apparel line 
Uh, I was out in California, and um, I was kind of everything was hinging on this one big deal I was working on with a with a big box retailer, and I ended up not getting to uh, I didn't get the deal. So what happened was um, I took the day off. I went to Venice Beach. I jumped on a, a rented cruiser bicycle. I thought that'd be the best way to you know sort of see the the area. Yeah. And uh, order ordered the bike for an hour. Came back six hours later. And uh, I was kind of hooked on the bikes, hmm. so came back to Dallas. Um, I bought me a cruiser bike. It was one of the first things I did. Um, just kind of kept riding it, bought a couple more, and next thing I know, I had about six cruiser bikes, and I was organizing these little rides with my friends. And then from there, my girlfriend said, you know, you should open up a cruiser bike shop. And I was like, hmm. So um, I just did it, not anticipating money or anything. I just said, you know, I'm just going to do something really for fun this time. Right. And what started out as my bike shop, it uh, just kept going in the creative type of person that I am, I ended up realizing that I could probably design cruiser bikes better than the ones I was buying. I was buying another brand. And um, but it took me about a year, and then I had to figure out a better way to sell them because I didn't really like the retail store. So um, that's when we created the website where you could design your own bike, yeah. and then that's how it all happened. I love your brand. It's, it, to me, it's a lifestyle brand that's just Thanks, man. very cool. Uh, but how, how long did it take you? I love hearing yeah. that you were an entrepreneur already. I mean, those of us that are entrepreneurs and several of our listeners are, we've uh, under our belt have some failures and some successes. And and uh, yep. and so the, those listening might be in one of those two modes right now. But how did you sure. – when did you realize I'm on to something here that's really scratching this entrepreneurial itch and it's and I think I'm on to something big? Yeah, well, the first thing I did, uh, Derek, and I, I, this is I want to say to the listeners – Anytime that you do something where you're combining something that doesn't really seem like it goes together, I find that it usually works out. So for me, hmm. opening up a beach cruiser bike boutique in Dallas, Texas, we don't have a beach within right. five, six hours of here. So that was the first thing. So I got noticed really quick because the only bikes that we were deal, you know, selling was cruiser bikes, and we don't really have a beach here. So right. um, I started getting a lot of notoriety, but when I really knew that we had something good was when we started designing our own bikes. And what I did differently than what the other brands out there do is I started putting together combinations of colors that people don't normally do. Because normally when you see a bike, it's like solid red with like black tires and silver rims or, you know, whatever. So we started mixing and matching and taking like green fenders, putting them on a blue bike and then, you know, like an orange chain guard. And it, it sounds kind of weird, but it got people's attention real quick. Right. So once, once I started noticing that people were like, wow, what kind of bike is this? And I really like how these look. That's when I realized we had something good, and I had to find a better way to get it out there instead of you know, just in the shop. You know what I mean? Right. So tell me about tell me about scale of a brand like this. What it, you know you don't have to give me all the details, but what did you hit any challenges that yeah. you weren't expecting as far as technology or, or customization for your website? And, and yeah, what did you have to overcome <laughs> that both of those? <laughs> what what did you have to overcome yeah, that you um, either weren't expecting or or was kind of a monster that you might be able to give us some some light on how you overcame it? Yeah, I think um, the big thing for us and I think for anyone is like you can have a great idea. Um, a great product, but you got to find a way to sell it, you know? Right. So for me, it was, it was switching from having a little, you know, beach bike boutique to having an online store where I could sell worldwide. How am I going to get the word out? How, I know I got a great product, but how are people going to know about my product? And I mean, here we are six years later, Derek, we're, we're still working on that all the time, but mm. it's really been, you know, finding a way to sell the bikes also with my product because we have so many parts and so much customization. It was the inventory, you know, the, the actual always being able to have those parts ready and being able to get the bikes ready in time because people don't mind waiting three weeks for a custom bike but you start getting a lot longer than that and people don't want to wait. They just want to go out and buy it. So we've had a lot of challenges right. but, um, in, in, in innovation. You know, you're always going to have that. So, so yeah. And, that, and that's a great point is consumers will wait for something custom, but we're very impatient in general and, and uh, it will only wait so long even for something custom. <laughs> yeah. And you know, 
I want to say one other thing about that. This is what I've learned, which is really funny, but if you're making a custom a custom product, people actually appreciate the fact that they've they have to wait as long as it's not beyond a certain point because there's a couple times in the early days where we'd be really slow and like we'd get a bike out within like a day or two and i would literally get calls from the people kind of complaining like how on earth did you custom make this bike so fast they almost didn't believe us you know so we've really found that you know that perfect time slot is kind of like two to three weeks and um that's about how long it takes anyway Mm. so Okay, and so are you? Yep. Are you in retail shops as well? No, um, we sell direct to the consumer to try to you know give that customization, which costs more, to try to pass that savings along, and um, we also sell our bikes, which is an incredible part of our business. We do a lot of um, corporate fleets of bikes for huge companies, so um, you know that we sell also direct to them, or sometimes we sell through um, you know they'll have like advertising reps or. Um, you know, marketing companies, promotional companies that work through them. So, but primarily, yeah, we do everything direct. I saw a note on you where said you didn't know what Shark Tank was when you got the call. I got a kick out of that uh, because the the word, yeah. the word entrepreneur is so popular right now, and it, and it wasn't a long time ago. Uh, but it's just such yeah. a, it's such a big buzzword now, especially with shows like that, which I love with all the venture capitalists and the investors and things like that. There's just a lot of opportunity. Kickstarter. Uh, there's so many ways yep. for for funding to to be achieved more quickly and and uh, to achieve market penetration more quickly and so many more ways to to distribute with with online and digital and social media options. But I thought that was really cool that you had no idea <laughs> what Shark Tank was when you got the call and then you got two rock star partners out of it. So any yep. highlights um, that stand out to you about your experience when and then when those around you found out you were doing the show or when you got on there, did you start to realize that that it could what a big deal it could be for helping propel your brand? Yeah. You- you know what was funny was because a lot of times you, you try out for the show, but we actually um, we got a call because they had seen an article that was written about our company. And yeah, when the guy called me up, I, I literally at first thought it was something to do with like sharks in a tank, <laughs> and I was gonna you know like send them off with like you know I don't I don't know. But long story short, once I checked it out and kind of looked at it, it's funny because I didn't take it that seriously at all until right before i went on the show i said you know i better i better practice a little bit so i practiced (laughs) i got i got a few of my friends and smart people and i said hey i want you guys to to like slice and dice me and i videoed it and when i videoed it it was absolutely the most embarrassing (laughs) performance ever Thank God I did that because um, it allowed me to kind of see what I was saying and how I looked and everything like that. And I went back and and really got serious about it. And um, that's what saved me on the show because I was pretty prepared. Yeah, I I recommend anybody going on Shark Tank. People call me all the time who are going on there, I think, just because I've been on the show. And I think they do that with a lot of a lot of contestants, but I always tell people, man, you better video yourself Mm. and you better practice a lot. (laughs) Wow. So tell me about, I I know you've got Golden State Warriors, uh, Clay Thompson, you've had Sean Payton, head coach of New Orleans Saints, buy some bikes. Tell me, tell me about Ellen DeGeneres. Oh, that was a great one. Um, Yeah, we actually, uh, they had been after us for a couple of years to give our bikes away. Um, But when you get go on the Ellen show, you have to give away bikes to your product to every single person in the wow. audience that's part of, part of the deal so <laughs> um we we packaged it together we did a deal with folgers and um you know folgers comped all the cost of our bikes so we were able to do that and um ellen was great she allowed our bikes to be the first and only product that she's ever autographed so we wow. had her signature on all of our bikes, and um, that was really cool. We have we've had Julianne Huff, who's a big celebrity right. with um, uh, Dancing with the Stars. Yes. We're doing uh, we're doing Jamie Foxx right now. Wow! Um, trying to think, uh, we're also doing the Dallas Cowboys bikes. Which oh, is that's huge. cool. So. Yeah, so um, um, as time goes by, we're, we're getting more and more stuff like that. That's so cool. I, I love it. I'm really happy for you guys. I love the vibe of rent. Tell me about the dog. Oh, man. Well, we're, on, uh, we're now on Billy number three, but <laughs> um, my, my, first, my first Billy was the start of it all. Yeah. Um, we lost him to uh, he got cancer. Hmm. And then my second dog, um, we had another health issue with him. So we're on number three, but uh, my dog comes to work every day with us. He's 
definitely keeping an eye on things. He keeps everybody in a, in a good state of mind around here. And he gets to do a lot of, like, TV stuff and magazine shoots. Yeah. And, um, you know, he's a big part of it. So people people really love the dog. You know, being a dog brand, you just attract so many, you know, animal people, which I think are the best people in the world. Right. So we got a great customer base because of the dog. <laughs> so what are some of the biggest lessons that you've learned as far as in, in your growth, as far as taking a brand like this and the journey you've been on for entrepreneurs or for those out there listening who are, have, have recently started a business that's their passion? What, what advice comes to mind for you that you might share with us? You know, I think the, I think the top three for me are a, you got to love what you're doing. And I said that, that earlier, but I mean, if you don't, there's no way you're going to, you're going to stick with it and get through all the hurdles. So number one, you better love what you're doing. Um, number two, before you put too much time and effort into it, you better figure out how you're going to sell it. Not is it good or do I like it or people like it, but how exactly am I going to sell this product? And then number three, uh, got to be very resourceful, um, especially if you're a startup. If you're, you know, if you're, especially if you're using your own money or whatnot, you've got to be smart. You cannot waste money on. Uh, the things that we like to do, fancy offices and stuff like that. So I, I literally, for for the first year and a half, I mean, I I really didn't take a salary or anything like that. So um, I'm a big believer in trading when you can. Um, we trade our bikes all the time for different things that we need and um, save a lot of money that way. So that's, mm. that's my three tips right there. Love that's what great. you're doing. Be resourceful. And uh, what was the other one? <laughs> know how you're going to sell it. Know how you're going to sell it. I think that's, well, all, all of those three in combination, I think, are the keys to success. Hmm. So how do you find balance in life between between running a successful company and then also <laughs> that, that question is a struggle sometimes for entrepreneurs? It really is. Um, you know, what I've been able to do, Derek, and it's taken me being uh, an entrepreneur for such a long time. I used to be the guy that was working 80 hours a week and I never did anything fun and you know I was really into that whole career end of it but as I've gotten a little bit more seasoned I've really learned that if you're going to grow the company you've got to got to be willing to delegate the things especially the things that either a I'm not good at or I don't like doing hmm. so um you got to hire good people you got to be willing to let go and trust those people and and um I think that's that's another key getting good people um there's this real smart guy that i always consult with and when i was starting out he was saying you know the most important thing you can do once you got your idea up and going and funded and everything like that it's you can hire a person who does the work of half of a normal person you can hire a person who does the work of a normal person or you can hire the person that does the work of two or three people and if you can hire that person that does two or three people's work you can have you know a lot more profitable company so Mm -hmm. everything that we do we all we all bust ass we do two or three people's jobs but we have fun doing it and it's key to get people like that you have to go through a lot of people to get the right ones if if they're not a superstar get rid of them move on replace them and i've I've, in five years we've probably replaced 30 different people here at billy custom Hmm. and you know really just the last i'd say year and a half we've really got like a a great team you know everybody just on point you know wow you've got a bunch of rock stars now yeah, we do. So don't try to pull anybody away from us. We're, <laughs> we're lucky. <laughs> so, so how do you how do you maintain focus with all the entrepreneurs? We have there's so many ideas run all the time. Some good, some bad. Yeah. How do you maintain maintain focus on what your core is? Yeah. Um, number one, everything that we do because everybody's pitching new ideas. You know, what about this? What about that? We keep um, very diligent and our focus on. Is it going to make us money? What is the ROI in doing this? Because we've made so many mistakes and wasted so much money along the way Hmm. trying different things. So you really focus on, okay, what's the payback on this deal? If the payback isn't obvious, it's not there, and we don't see it, I'm sorry, we're moving on to the next thing. But But beyond that, you know, our focus at Billy Customs make make super quality very unique 
custom cruiser bikes, and that's it. That's why we don't go into mountain bikes or road mm. bikes or three-wheelers. People are always trying to get us to do that, and I'm always like, no, this is what we do. We do, you know, so, you know, your question is my answer. We focus on really what we love, which yeah. is the cruiser bikes. That's you know? great. That's that's a great focus to keep from getting distracted. So what yep. are you most passionate about? Uh, you know, for me, I'm most passionate about um, making people happy, making, you know, making people have fun. And, um, you know, I really, I'm always saying this, it's like our style of bike, it's not for cyclists. You know, cyclists mm-hmm. is only about eight percent of the population the guys that you know get the fancy shoes and the helmet and all the gear and the ten thousand dollar bike whereas our bikes is for general q public you know betty and joe jump on the bikes go slow pull over have a margarita uh, you know drive around see you know see the sights and sounds of wherever you are and really just kick back have fun you know, the world, it's so fast paced now with technology and everything coming at us. So for me, it's getting on that bike and just kicking back and having fun. And that that's what I'm passionate about. And that's what everyone up here is passionate about that works mm-hmm. here. That's awesome. So you've got so many exciting things coming up, but is there anything else you've yet to accomplish that's on your bucket list, your wish list that you would want to clear some time for and do? Um, I think, you know, for, for company wise, um, we really, you know, we want to get superstars <laughs> helping us because these influencers today is really what can take your, your bike brand, you know, or your lifestyle brand to a whole nother level. And so we want to become a little bit more of a lifestyle brand, not just bikes. And um, mm. hopefully some of these um, these big names that we're, you know, we're really trying to get on board with us um, is going to help us. So, so I would say that becoming a little bit more of a lifestyle brand, selling apparel, soft goods and other things. Um, that's one of our big goals. So, um, I'd say that it, me as, me as a person, um, just travel more and enjoy, um, just enjoy, enjoy seeing things I haven't seen before. So just a couple final questions. You've got our listeners out there. Maybe they're uh, maybe they're in transition. Maybe they're in a an, in a sea level job, or they're in a cubicle, or maybe they've just launched on their own. What do you yep. want to tell them about the satisfaction of life and, and following that entrepreneurial itch that they may be having? Sometimes you know it's really hard, especially if you've got a lot of responsibilities and you know you got to make X number of dollars and and whatnot. But I think anybody you know we live in such a great great country to where. It doesn't matter, you know, if you, you've got a good idea and you're willing to put in the hard work, I believe that anybody can do it. I'm, I'm a very average person. I mean, it's not like I made good grades and I wasn't really good at anything, but, um, you know, I've, I've always thought of ideas that I think are cool or that I like, and I've been able to put it together. So if I could do it, you know, pretty much anybody can. I really believe that. And I, I talk about that all the time with people. It's like... If you've got something that you're really wanting to do, you got to go for it. You only you only live once, right? Mm, yeah. Is there anything else you want to share with us today? Man, I would just say exactly what you were just talking about. You know, if you've got a great idea, just go for it. Find a way. If you've got a good idea, you can sell it. You know what yeah. I'm saying? You, you can get the people on board with you if you don't have the money or if you don't have the, the know-how to do it, but you've got a great idea – you could sell it to people out there. People got to not be, don't be shy about it. You know, just, just go for it. Yeah. And there's so many resources now, as we talked about earlier from Kickstarter and other campaigns. And, and, uh, if you've got a good idea, there's, there's, like you said, there's people that, that will be interested in it and there are resources out there to launch it. Absolutely, man. You can, you can sell anything if you believe in it hard enough. So yeah. thanks for being our guest today. Oh, for sure, I want man. to encourage your listeners go to go to villicustoms.com. I promise you if you go there, you're going to find a bike that you want. You're going to want to start building yours. I've seen three or four that I love already. I pull up the website. It says, where's yours? I love that. And uh, I see a Coca-Cola bike here, too. That's pretty cool. <laughs> there you go. Hey, and also I want to say um, that's Billy with a V as in victory. And if they footnote uh, your show, Derek, uh, we can we can score twenty uh, percent off on any oh, custom man. bikes. Wow. I want to offer that to thank you to, to everybody listening. So thank yeah, you just, so just much. That's, that's very generous of you. I really appreciate that. Hey, twenty percent—that's our friends and family. So um, 
just uh, just mention this, uh, email us, and uh, we'll take good care of them. Awesome. Villy Customs, that's V-I-L-L-Y customs.com. Man, thank you again to Fleetwood Hicks. Thank you to Stephen Sasha and Michael Levin for being our guests, for being friends of our show. Um, and we appreciate the wisdom that you've shared with us. Again, go back and listen to the in the archives of the Business Leadership Series on iTunes or on Podomatic or even on the businessleadershipseries.com. And you can look at the full interviews from them and from uh, 50 plus other guests, including Shark Tank and The Prophet and other shows. Hey, we'll be joining you again next week with our Series 3 with other great interviews from our Shark Tank guests where they're talking about their experience as well. We'll talk to you next week. You've been listening to the Business Leadership Series, where we engage with leaders who are making an impact on their worlds and who want to share their knowledge and experience for your personal and professional growth. This interview was designed to inspire you to become the best leader you can be. 